really good lunch. Um, I've been stood here missing out on lunch and trying to get my slides working with the projector, which we her up. The, the coolest bit, actually, is that you, I've learned how to play about with the lights in here, which I, has no practical value whatsoever. You can do all sorts of fun things with that. Um, so this talk, I'm going to talk, this talk is for people who are familiar writing with Perl, done quite a bit with the language, um, probably work with Perl, but maybe just do it for fun, um, but haven't really interacted much with Perl community yet, haven't given that stuff back to see. So if you're not interested in that, I won't mind if you leave now, that's fine. Um, but if you are interested, stick there. So, who am I? Well, I've been using Perl for about a decade and a half, and over time I've improved my knowledge, learned more about the language, more about programming, and I found that working professionally as a Perl programmer and participating within CPAN, I've not released my own distributions to CPAN, but I help other people work on theirs. I found that both those sides of work made me a better Perl programmer, made me look at things from various different perspectives. Um, so I'm going to kind of share, for those of you today who maybe know a bit about Perl but haven't been so involved in the community, how that can help you and how you might, some ideas for how you might go about interacting <coughs> with people. So, at the end of this talk, you should have a rough idea of what CPAN distributions contain. Now, I'm going to use the, words, the phrase CPAN distributions, and you might think a lot about CPAN modules. Now, the difference between a CPAN distribution and a module is that a distribution contains a collection of modules, it contains tests, it contains informa build information, other information about those modules. Mm. So, a distribution is kind of a collection of stuff, a, the .r.gz file that ships on CPAN. Um, so, I'm going to talk about how CPAN distributions hang together. I'm going to take, talk about some of the approaches that de developers take, how development takes place over how distributions improve over time. And I'm going to mention some of the approaches that you can take to make changes you care about. So if you're using a CPAN module and you want it to be a bit different, how might you go about that? Now, as someone who writes Perl in a professional environment and in the open source community, I find myself taking very different approaches. At work, you've, you've got managers, you've got important people, you've got commercial pressure. So if, someone's, if you say to someone, I need you to do this for Friday, this is important, but, you know, they might do it. In the open source world, if you go to someone and say, I need you to do this to fri on Friday, they probably won't do it. Um, the motivations are very different. People are doing open source oh, for fun, or for they're, 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 the, the reason is I don't want to give it well, for fun. <laughs> I don't know, it's a strange compulsion that people fall into. Uh, so yeah, communicating with people is hard. All CPAN maintainers are different, just as all the contributors are different. And you might find with some CPAN maintainers, you can kind of build up a rapport with them. With others, for reasons that may need to do with you or may need to do with them, it just might not work out. So, you know, don't, don't worry about that. There are lots of maintainers and lots of distributions out there. So, if the one you're, if you don't get on with someone, definitely you can go and help somewhere else. So, really this talk falls into two themes. There's the technical side of things and the social side of things. And whilst you're doing your work, Take both of these into consideration. Always think about who you're interacting with, as well as the code that you're writing. So, let's... Yeah, not yet, sorry. So, as I've already said, people have lots of different reasons for wanting to change code on CPAN. Uh, maintainers will probably have different concerns to you in the code. They, they might not care, you might be stuck on Perl 561 in your business for some reason, but the, de the developers might say, you know, we've got 5.14, 5.12, 5.10, they might not care about your old version of Perl. Um, on the other hand, generally, if you submit a patch that makes something more portable and doesn't um, introduce any extra overhead, they, they, they might accept that, so you can have a discussion to see about that. But, for example, you might be using some code in a performance-critical context where you care about performance, but the maintainer might code care a bit more about maintainability, about readability. So there's always going to be conflicts in, in, in the work that you, that you do because different people have different aims. Um, one thing that's a useful thing you can do is testing your code, your code against BleedPerl, which is kind of the latest bleeding edge development version. And there's a tool called PerlBrew that makes it really easy to do this. Now this helps you spot bugs in the language, and bugs in CPAM distributions quicker and easier. So that's a, a useful thing you can do to go and contribute to a module. Um, also documentation. Now, people who are new to code often write the best documentation, 
The maintainer has had this vague idea, has gone through the design process, and then written code. So the person who's done that might not be the best person to document the code from a beginner's perspective. So if, if you're new to a module and you're reading the documentation, you think, this sucks, this needs to be better. You know, most people, most CPAN maintainers will love you if, you if you send them some documentation. If you can write it in pod, which is the documentation format CPAN modules use, that's great. But if you can't, just scribble something down in your text editor and, and send it off. Um, the, the, the worst that you'll get is, is no. Um, people, people do write that to see the improvements. So here's a rough idea of how um, distributions are structured. There's various files and directories. And as I've already said, people vary. The structure of distributions varies a lot. These, these are some things that you'll often find in there. But there can be all sorts of ways that people choose to arrange their code. Um, so you might get some example scripts in an examples directory. Um, don't worry too much about changes in ink because usually the maintainer will deal with those. The makefile.pl or the build.pl if you're using module build is, is the key thing that basically um, starts your installation process. So you'll use that to build and install and test the modules. Um, the other interesting thing is meta.yaml and meta.json which contain metadata about the module and tools like search.cpan.org, uh, metacpan.org, cpan testers and other use this metadata to link off to helpful things like uh, source code repositories, bug trackers, that sort of stuff. Um, T is where the, the tests for the module live, so you run tests to check that the module will work effectively in your environment. And XT is a little directory you'll sometimes see. XT contains additional tests for the authors to run. In addition to these things, um, some authors will use maintenance tools such as Module Starter, or distzilla, and distzilla is very popular nowadays. And people use these to generate a lot of these files. So if you're checking out from a source code repository, you might want to read up on module build or distzilla if the maintainer of the module you're working on is using those. So once you've got yourself um, a module to work with, how do you go about building it? Well, it's quite simple if you're using something like xutils makemaker, which is quite common. You just follow this process. If you're using module build, it's slightly different. Um, Distilla uses the diesel commands to generate parts of this from a build.ini file. So that's great. But of course, that's not always the real world. Sometimes your tests fail. And when your tests fail, there's a handy command that comes with Perl called prove. So you can run just the specific test that you've had problems with. And here you'll see I'm running it with minus BV options. Minus V gives you verbose output, so you can see the whole test suite running. And minus B pulls in the modules you're using from a, a directory called blib or glib. And what that is, when you've built your module, Perl will take the contents of your lib directory, where all the libraries live, the modules, and put them into blib. Um, the reason it's doing that is for when you've got things like excess or binary code. It's basically the build phase. So if you've got pure Perl code, you can say minus L instead of minus B uh, to run against your lib directory instead of blib. Now, once you've encountered a problem, you'll want to investigate it. It may be that someone's already found, found this problem, so checking bug reports is useful. Uh, problems can occur for all sorts of reasons. You might have an old version of Perl, a really new or developed version of Perl, or an old or obscure operating system. Also, you might have um, unusual versions of CPAN modules already installed, and it might be that there's a conflict between the sets of, of versions you have. So. Doing all of these things, downloading the latest version of the module to see if it's been fixed. Um, last of all, I've put in searching the web. Just you know, going to your favourite search engine and typing in the error message you've got might find some, some further information. Okay, but of course a lot of the time, you'll, so this will give you useful information. It might help you solve the problem, it might not. Um, but you can go to metacpan.org to find useful information about distributions. Here I'm looking at popular LWP, and on that I can see useful information like the bug tracker that that distribution uses, or I can go and check out the source code from its repository. But the problem is those things are coming out of the metadata that I've already mentioned, the meta.yaml or meta.json files, and sometimes people don't keep the metadata up to date, so it's worth checking the documentation as well. Um, mm -hmm. Often authors, authors might say, they might have a link to a bug tracker, but authors might actually prefer bugs submitted by email. So figure out what the author prefers and accommodate them. Um, 
If the metadata is wrong, and those links that I showed you before are wrong, why not go and patch the metadata and send your new patch to the author? Then you've just contributed. Now, CPAN testers is a very useful tool. If you're interested in CPAN testers, go hop in your time machine and go to Leon Bockhardt's talk before lunch, where he shows us what CPAN testers does. Um, it's basically showing you lots of different operating systems, different versions of Perl, and how well the tests for that module run. Um, now, there are people out there who run huge amounts of, of tests, so this is a really useful resource. I, I kind of think sometimes of the James Bond buddy with his underground lair filled full of servers testing every CPAN module there is to try and break them. And that's kind of one way you can think of what the CPAN testers are doing. So if you've encountered a problem, it might be specific to a version of Perl, an operating system, then you can go and look at them. And you can become a CPAN tester yourself. If you go to the CPAN testers wiki, or um, install the CPAN report to Perl module, you can help other people to see um, problems with their modules whenever you install them. You don't actually have to be a James Bond buddy yourself. All you have to do is just install a module, and that will automatically send a report out which helps people see how well their code works. So, once you've done your investigation and you've confirmed that the problem hasn't already been fixed, you can start making a change. But when you're making your change, Avoid code bonds. Now, what code bonds are is where you take some code, you go off and you hack on it, and you think, oh, this would be cool, and you change this, and you change that. And you end up with a big, huge difference to what the original code was, and you fire it off the author and say, hey, here you go, I've done some cool stuff. Now, when the author looks at all your changes, they're going to see lots of different ideas all mangled in together, and they'll get really confused. So break your, your changes out into small coherent changes, Work with the, the maintainers, submit your changes frequently. <coughs> um, if you're fixing a bug, write a test case. Simple to, you can read up on test more. Uh, there's a very good O'Reilly book called Pill Testing, which you can look at if you don't know about tests yet. Um, so you can add tests for the new function, the bug that you've fixed, so the test fails before your fix is applied and passes afterwards. And if you're writing new code, add tests that show how the new functionality works. Uh, the Unix diff tool is very useful for building patches to send to the author, but it's also very useful whilst you're working. You can run diff yourself and read through the changes and say, wait a minute, why did I do that? What's going on there? Try to create a really coherent, readable diff that, that, that explains what it is that you're doing. And finally, you might want to ask a friend or a small group of people who you trust for their feedback before you go out to the big scary Perl community, which actually isn't that big and scary, but sometimes it, it can seem that way. Um, so, maintainers prefer to apply patches they can easily understand, as I've already mentioned, and they really want to minimise the work that they do. Git is really popular now. Lots of CPAN distributions use Git or, and GitHub as well. If you can put your, if you're working with Git, put your repository somewhere public and point the maintainers at it and say, here's, here's what I've worked on. That means they can see all the individual changes that you've made. If you've written helpful commit messages, they'll know why you've made those changes. So again, it's much like uh, working on any size of a project. Um, also, help the maintainer check that these things make sense. Provide tests, as I've said. If you're submitting documentation, um, give some context. Basically, provide evidence. The work you're doing will hopefully stand on its own, but the more supporting evidence you can give someone to explain why you're doing it, what, why it makes sense, that will make uh, the maintainer's life easier. So, once you've done your work, you want to submit it. I've already mentioned that you should check bug reports to see if something's already been reported or fixed. Uh, look for duplicates. Now, if you find that someone has reported your bug but hasn't fixed it, don't open a new ticket. Just attach your patch to the existing ticket. On the other hand, also, don't follow a ticket if, you're, if you've discovered something that's, that's slightly similar but isn't really the same problem. Then create a new ticket. Um, sharing your repository if you're using distributed version control is important, as I've already said. So that's the technical side. But also, try not to let criticism offend you. Okay, it, it offends us all. We're all human. Um, but often, people are really busy. CPAN maintainers, there are people out there who maintain like 150 CPAN distributions, which is a lot compared to my zero. And I don't have enough <laughs> spare time. So these people really probably don't have that much spare time. So, so think about the underlying problem they're trying to get across to you. Don't get offended. Think, why are they saying this? Where are they coming from? 
Um, but at the same time, do state your case effectively. If it seems that someone's missing the point, I submitted a patch to a CPAN module a while ago, which was ignored. Um, I got in touch with the author and said, hey, you've, you've not applied this patch. And he said, oh yeah, you don't need to do that. And you did need to do that. So I explained to him why, why it made sense. I showed him how it failed before and afterwards. And he said, oh yeah, thank you. He applied my patch. About six months later, someone actually sent another patch that backed out the changes I'd made because they thought the changes I'd made were wrong. And the author could say, no, no, here's, what, here's why this is the right way to do it. So, you know, you need to communicate with people. Also, it can take years for patches to get into distributions sometimes. I found a weird bug with a PHP serialization module years ago, sent a patch. And about three years later, I got this email from someone saying, hey, I've applied your patch, and I've completely forgotten I've written it. But that, that's, it was, I wasn't using PHP at that point, but, you know, it was nice to know that it had been useful for someone. <coughs> so stay positive. It, what, like I say, you might be waiting for years and years. So if someone does say, no, that's a really bad idea, that's a really crappy idea, you know, that's actually really good. So someone's giving you some feedback. Um, it may be, like I said, CPAN maintainers, authors are often really busy. So if you do get a rejection message, it might be that the author has been for years and years thinking, I'd like to add this to my module. And they've been thinking about it at the back of mind, and I'll do it this way, I'll do it that way. And you come along, and you might have a solution to the problem, but they're like, no, that's not quite what, what I wanted. And they're frustrated that you haven't done what you wanted. And they're also jealous, because you had the time to do it, and they didn't. So, you know, if you get rejection, think about the different reasons why it might happen, and what the maintainer might mean. Um, it also, it is easier to deal with people who you have a bit of a track record with. If you've, if you've met the maintainer at a London Pearl workshop, a London PM social at a Yapsi, or natted with them online through some mailing list or IRC, I find that sometimes um, makes it easier to deal with people, although sometimes, you know, they, they might be a bit more rude to you if they know you as well. Um, finally, you, you'll be prepared to give up. Your work just might not get used, and that's no reflection on anything. People are busy. The directions the author wants to take the module in might be different to yours. You know, it's, it's not an office environment whereby you'll have someone saying, we have to do this. It, it, it's a, the open source world is, is um, peculiar. But please do help improve the pill. I don't want to sound negative. It's, it's really rewarding. It, it impresses people, you know, if you, when you start saying to people, when you meet someone and they say, oh, I use this module, and you say, oh, yeah, I fixed a bit of that. They're like, oh, that's good. Um, it helps you learn. You know, when I say you get, might get these slightly fierce uh, <laughs> feedback from CPAN maintainers, usually, usually there's stuff in there that you can learn from, so you're kind of like getting free tuition. Um, it feels good to contribute. And if you're lucky, if someone really, really likes the work that you've done, they might buy your beer. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>